Honorable Speaker, Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Leader of the Opposition, Honorable Ministers and Assistant Ministers, Honorable Members of Parliament, distinguished guests, and our citizenry, the people of Fiji. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to contribute to the debate on the opening address of His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Fiji, Tirongpala Timodwata, Ratwilia Mehmaivali Likatunibere, at the 2023-2024 session of Parliament. Before I begin, Honorable Speaker, I would like to congratulate you, sir, on your appointment as Speaker of this High Office, and to the Deputy Speaker, Honorable Lenero Ngeratamboa, this August House, and the people of Fiji look forward to your guidance. I would like to thank His Excellency for his words of encouragement and reassurance as we, the leaders and people of Fiji, together walk this new journey of democracy, of democracy. Thank you, sir. I also join His Excellency in acknowledging the previous administration and the smooth transition we have had. We're inheriting a functioning government and a country that is fiscally intact. But with my eight years in Parliament, we could have done better, and we will do better, especially in strengthening institutions. They have been greatly weakened over the last year, few years. The people of Fiji demanded change because after 16 years, they deserve nothing less. So I take this, take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, sir, to thank our people for exercising their rights and making their vote count. I say this not, not as an elected minister, but as a citizen of our beloved nation. Mr. Speaker, sir, I am humbled to be given the opportunity to be part of the leadership to lead the people of Fiji and to lead in a spirit of conciliation and collaboration. Our duty is to those who have faith and confidence to help us to reach where we are today. Mr. Speaker, sir, as I look back, it is hard to imagine that the fate of the nation essentially came down to my party. Today, I stand very proudly alongside my colleagues from two other parties, knowing that all the effort is starting to pay, and in time, this will be measured by our delivery. So I take this opportunity to thank my family, especially my wife, my children and grandchildren, who stood by me as we set out to change the cost of democracy. My sincere gratitude to the Ngoneturanga Mataiwalangi, Ratu Epanisha Nakumbau, under his presidency, I became party leader. And our president today, Ratu Manua Rorasangava, and also my thanks to the General Secretary and his team. And as I did on my appointment to Parliament almost a decade ago, I thank my people of Nandronga Navosa, from Namatakula to Yako, to the Highlands, and to the islands of Riatu Malolo and Watulele. During this campaign, I stood also for Pachamba, and I'm very grateful for the support especially from the Yatu Yasawa. My special tribute to my campaign team, my Kudelebu Baba Samu of Yako, my Kudelebu Buki also of Yako, my Kudelebu Namisi of Nawaka, and my Kudelebu Muliratu of Narewa. It is therefore my great honor that I deliver my maiden address as a Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Tourism and Civil Aviation. On democracy, Mr. Speaker, sir, His Excellency the President, in his opening address, rightly highlighted the need for a clear focus on the rule of law and democratic processes. Democracy is in true democracy if the values of transparency, accountability, and respect are not upheld. Laws are not made for the government. They are made by the government with its people for the people. We made a commitment as the coalition government to read this nation, this nation of false promises that our people have been beholden to for far too long. 
we made a commitment not just to hear, but to listen and to act. For the first time in nearly two decades, the deliberations of the cabinet are being shared with the public. Even as members of this August House, we were never given the courtesy to contribute to matters that affect our people. Mr. Speaker, sir, we will no longer pass overnight legislations that take away the rights of the indigenous people in the name of streamlining investments. We will no longer rob our people of their freedom of expression in the name of media safety. We will no longer deny residents the right to choose who they believe has their best civic interests. We will no longer deny employees the right to be represented by unions. That, Mr. Speaker, is true democracy. Yeah. On finance, Mr. Speaker, sir, to get our house in order is our priority. We acknowledge the current fiscal pace we are in. We also acknowledge debt isn't necessarily bad. But to have our national debt reach 85% of GDP, or $10 billion by July 2023, is no responsible borrowing at all. At a time where our focus should be on rebuilding, giving the people of Fiji basic infrastructure, such as health, adequate health, facilities and services, access to safe, safe and clean drinking water, and sustainable educational services, we are heavily constrained. Mr. Speaker, sir, I therefore support the appointment of a fiscal review committee and the National Economic Summit in the spirit of transparency and consultation. On the coalition vision, Mr. Speaker, sir, there is goodwill amongst our people in the international community. This is not necessarily driven by politics, but a renewed sense of optimism that things have changed. As is actually stated, our mission is to build unity and trust, and we truly, truly intend on doing so. The principles of Christianity will remain the foundation of our policies. We will work humbly with others for the common good. We will defend the rights of the poor and needy and give unconditionally to the vulnerable. We will love our neighbors. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, sir, one of my commitments has always been to give tourism and civil aviation sector the stature they deserve. Here we are talking about a sector that contributes 40% of our GDP, a sector that supports thousands of jobs and livelihoods. Unfortunately, the previous administration did not see the importance of these key sectors and reduced two very critical arms of government, tourism and civil aviation, to mere government departments, clustered with many other departments. Under this government, this has changed. We have restored the Ministry of Tourism and Civil Aviation as a standalone entity that can act as a better support system to the private sector. On tourism numbers, Mr. Speaker, sir, I strongly support His Excellency's statement that in the short-term economic outlook, supporting tourism will be critical. That is a reality. Fiji's economic recovery continues on the back of a strong tourism rebound. In 2022, our visitor arrivals surpassed, surpassed expectations, reaching 71.1% of 2019 levels, underpinned by the Australia, New Zealand, and the US markets. In December last year, Honorable Speaker, we recorded the highest number of Australians in, in history in a single month. Mr. Speaker, sir, I come from the industry, and I know how challenging the pandemic would have been on the operators. So I take this opportunity to thank the industry for its sacrifices and the remarkable commitment in getting us through some of our darkest days. Mr. Speaker, sir, in the first few days of taking office, I visited, I visited many tourism stakeholders. I can say with a lot of confidence that we are now in a new era of economic development. In the first quarter of 2023, we have exceeded pretend pandemic levels as far as hotel bookings go. Just in the last week of January, the average occupancy recorded was 75%. In 2019, the average occupancy for this time, for the same week, was 43%. The revenue per available room, or rev par, recorded for this week, this week was $305, much higher than 2019 levels. Looking at February to April 2023, 
top countries searching for accommodation are Australia, New Zealand, and the US, with an average length of stay of up to seven days. So tourists intend to stay longer. The Associate Mr. Speaker said the confidence people have in our tourism and Fiji as a country. As an example, Mr. Speaker, Sir Costaway Allen considers 2022 as the best year since beginning its operation in 58 years. This year, they forecast it to be even better. Nationally, occupancy rates were up 74% in 2022 compared to 68% in 2019 with a higher guest satisfaction. So there is a lot of optimism, Mr. Speaker, sir. I'm pleased to share that Fiji Airways forward bookings for the next 12 months is 40% ahead of the same period in 2019. When I met the executive management of Fiji Airways last month, we were recording bookings at an 8% rate weekly. Even with our markets open, the bookings are better than 2019. This is an unprecedented and historical achievement as our national airline exceeded any, any and all expectations. <clears throat> Forward plans, Mr. Speaker, sir. We are currently bound by the budget of the previous administration for the most part, but we will continue to deliver. Nine years ago, I stood in this August house and shared my hopes of contributing to the development of our country. At that time, we spoke of some $2 billion in tourism earnings. As the former CEO of the then Fiji Business Bureau, I questioned who the billions were for. I stand by that today as we strive for a more equitable sharing of the billions from tourism. We will no longer confine our ethos on what we can do for tourists, but also significantly what they can do for us. It will be a give and take. On enhancing connectivity, Honorable Speaker, over 90% of visitors to Fiji arrive by air. For us, our national airline carries 70% of arrivals. Mr. Speaker, sir, Fiji Airways will continue to invest in advanced, fuel-efficient, modern aircraft. We are also looking at the addition of two new airbuses, A350s. These aircrafts are the most advanced in commercial aviation and a remarkable addition to a fleet that adds to our reach. Mr. Speaker, sir, with added seats, we have the option to add capacity to fly to routes that are in demand and the flexibility, flexibility to explore other markets. As His Excellency said, Fiji Airways is expanding its global network, which means that it will continue to invest in new routes. We are already reporting strong numbers since the direct flights to Vancouver, Canada. By April 2020, we will also be returning to Hong Kong, Japan, and Hong Kong. The forecast for 2023 is to carry 2 million passengers and revenue of, of, over $1.5 billion in 2023. Mr. Speaker, sir, the North American middle market, income market, has a huge potential for us. We are now exploring the possibility of flying to Dallas, Seattle, or Houston without compromising our position on open skies. The national carrier is a five-star rated airline that is on a journey to becoming world-class, a feat that very few airlines have achieved. Mr. Speaker, sir, our national air carrier is our pride, from its inception to the days of the episode. Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Order, order. Our national airline is our pride, from its inception to the days of the Pacific, and now Fiji Airways. There is, there, there is, there is this weird, the weird belief by Fiji First that they are the only ones who are proud of our airline. We've been proud of it since the days of the Pacific Honorable Speaker. We've supported it all along the way. Mr. Speaker, sir, soon we'll drop the requirement for vaccination and insurance to enter Fiji. We are a highly vaccinated nation, and this gives us the confidence to take the next step in easing travel. Honorable Speaker, sir, we have a new global brand. We have just launched a new brand where happiness comes naturally. This pays homage to our people, our natural, our rich culture, giving visitors a feel of what it truly means to be happy in our context. Tourism Fiji's website tracking, tracking shows 20% lift in traffic and 20% lift in new users since the launch of the new campaign. 
on driving investments, Mr. Speaker, sir, with an increase in air capacity and strong air product for future tourism brand, there is a risk of imbalance between rooms and seats. It is a good problem to have, but one that requires a concerted effort to attract investments. At present, we have a pipeline of investments valued at approximately $280 million with about 1,000 rooms in inventory that could create hundreds of jobs for our people. That is the power of tourism in Fiji, so we need more strategic investments. Mr. Speaker, sir, we want to connect investment-ready projects to investors, so we have more rooms to be able to attract more visitors. In March this year, we are looking to host the first Tourism Investment Summit in partnership with Investment Fiji and Tourism Fiji. This will be an exclusive gathering of 50 key tourism investors, hoteliers, brands, and associated businesses that gives us the opportunity to attract legitimate investors to boost investments. It is about time we think bigger and act on it. A tourism investment report will also be launched capturing key information that an investor requires to know that Fiji is open for business. At this point, I want to clear the perception of high liquors in tourism. We now most, own most of the properties in Fiji, Honorable Speaker, in the likes of the Marriott, Intercontinental, Sheraton, Westin, GPH, Holiday Inn, all are now locally owned by the people. In community-based tourism, Honorable Speaker, I want to add that the intent is not to build multi-complex five stars all around Fiji. Instead, we want to nurture and support smaller, more community-owned businesses who can add to the pipeline of inventory. A few weeks ago, the Honorable Prime Minister and I met the people of the Asawas, Mr. Speaker. In 2016, there were some 38 locally owned businesses in the Yathya Sawa. Today, there are only nine remaining. If we bring them back online, which we will do, we are adding to the room bank that we sorely need. Our plan going forward is to support our resource owners and our indigenous people. So they, they too can, can have a larger share of the tourism pie. Tourism destinations like the Yasawas, who have a huge potential, have been somewhat neglected. And we have spoken about this for years in this parliament. To support indigenous Fijians, to support the Vanua, does not mean we are going back in time. Indigenous communities have been marginalized to the point of being considered amongst the, the vulnerable today. What we encourage is the protection and appropriate promotion of indigenous culture, traditional knowledge, the land and waters on which it is based. This way, there is an equitable partnership between the tourism industry and indigenous people. Last week, Honorable Speaker, I was at a UN Development Program event where eight investment-ready projects are now being scaled up through a Blue Accelerator Grant Scheme. One of them was Auto Nialo and Talano Tracks, who intend to develop Fiji's first ever ocean trail build, building using traditional sailing knowledge. We are bringing back some of the old ways, and these are the types of products that can complement tourism in the outer islands, such as the Asawa. Mr. Speaker, sir, as the Ministry responsible for civil aviation, we also intend to invest in our airports, especially those in the outer islands. I have met with the chair and management of Fiji airports, and we are looking to upgrade the airport terminals in Lambasa, Nausori, Nandi Domestic, and Sabu Sabu during the next 18 months. Mr. Speaker said, the intent here is to create a level playing field. We want the infrastructure to be built as such that it accommodates different aircraft fleets, both the Fiji Link, Link and Northern Air. We need to encourage healthy competition for the sake of not just tourists, but for our people. Mr. Speaker said, on displacing tourism, one more level, our second largest island needs to get the attention it deserves and so do the other islands in Fiji. We are one, and we should grow as one. Yes. Mr. Speaker, sir, we are now advancing discussions with the World Bank to finance the upgrade of critical infrastructure in the north. I will be soon taking this to cabinet and to our people of one world level. On improving business and private, private sector-led investments, Mr. Speaker, sir, I will wholeheartedly support His Excellency's statement on the coalition government's focus on building confidence and trust with businesses and investors. For years, we have been hearing about business reforms in this August House. To what end, I don't know. 
Business reform should be based on its impact to investors and to the people. We know that some good work has been put in making Fiji more investor friendly for both foreign and local investments. Mr. Speaker said we need to work on that intensely. In my first week in office, we allowed the commencement of an important project that was issued as stop work for no apparent or legal reason. This was a development worth $31 million and had already invested $9 million in value, in value, in value. We can defy transparency and expect investor confidence this way. We quickly uplifted this uh, stop order, uh, Honorable Speaker. On regionalism, the Honorable Prime Minister has led Fiji's re-engagement with our Pacific family. We are reminded of the power of a coalition, a partnership. We need to restore the balance of interest between Fiji and the Pacific. We are one people with common identity and common challenges and opportunities. Fiji does owe a duty of care to the Pacific family. Mr. Speaker say we will strengthen our relations with the Pacific Tourism Organization, SPTO. As a regional minister, I intend to usher in a new partnership built on a duty of care to one another. We will also bring back our island neighbors to be part of the Fiji Tourism Expo as was the case in the past. It is a premier trade exchange with a huge international profile that brings buyers and sellers together. It should also benefit our neighbors. Fiji should truly become the, the hub of the region, Honorable Speaker. Mr. Speaker, sir, we need to look beyond our, our short-term margins. We need to invest in our businesses, invest in our people and their capabilities, invest in preserving the environment. What do we, what do we take? we must return. To the people of Fiji, please remember your hardships are no longer yours alone to overcome. Time will bear testament. Our leadership as the coalition government is what will shape the society we want today and tomorrow. We will walk this journey together. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and may the God Almighty bless our beloved nation.